Hello, I'm Harry Rick Moody. I was with AARP for many years, and now I'm a visiting professor at Fielding Graduate University. And I'm Jennifer Sasser. I direct the gerontology programs at Merrillhurst University in Portland, Oregon, and I co-author the text Aging, Concepts, and Controversies with this guy. That's me. We're here to talk about a very important question today. The question is this, should older people have the right to make bad choices? And I want to bring that question down to earth with a, an example that came to me just last week when my friend David came to me, told me about an incident that happened with his uh, elderly mother. She's 86 years old. She was walking in her garden in the evening. She fell, apparently, and couldn't get up. And she stayed in the garden all night, tried to crawl in, never made it to the house. Who knows what would have happened if his sister hadn't stopped by at 9.30 the next morning. Hmm. When I heard about this case, all I could think of was people need help. In this case, his mom was putting herself in danger. That kind of thing shouldn't happen. Hmm. We shouldn't let it happen. Hmm. My, I have a mixed response. My first response is it must have been a terribly frightening situation for the mother as well as for her children. I'm really sorry she had to experience that. On the other hand, there's something really lovely about the idea that she was walking in her garden in the early evening. And I would never want to take that away from her. Well, we're not trying to convict her of the crime of walking in her garden, but we're trying to recognize that something in this situation is dangerous. This isn't the first time she's fallen. I heard from David that she'd fallen several times before. If she keeps going on this trajectory, she's going to fall one of these times, and nobody's going to come the next morning. Or maybe she breaks her hip. Maybe she dies in her garden. What do we do then? But you said she's living at, in her own home. Yes, she is. Well, you know, people make decisions all the time that I may not agree with, but they're adults and they have a right to make decisions. I mean, we do weird stuff all the time that perhaps is putting us at risk. Why should she be any different? Well, we're not talking about skydiving. We're not talking about some sort of uh, strange activity, but we're talking about something which is repeatedly, day after day, going to put herself in danger. And I worry hmm. that she doesn't know what she's doing, and she's doing the wrong thing. I asked myself, why did the sister let this happen? I don't know the whole story there, but there's something going on with the sister, the mother, the brother. Uh, it's, it's, it's a problem. She's putting herself well, in danger. I, OK, you've just brought a new element into the story, which is that um, you don't know why the sister wasn't cognizant of the fact that yeah. the mother might be in danger. Right. Um, and so it sounds a little more complicated than it did originally. And there's, there's the mother's behavior, yes. which you've said is characterized by bad choices. I think it's a bad okay. choice. And then, I think it's a terrible choice. Then there's the sister who is, is her caregiver, but wasn't actually there to right. care for her. Right. Okay. She lives nearby. David does not live nearby. He can't okay. get there very often. Uh, but the sister is supposed to be the first line of defense. Uh, she comes there every few days. Uh, matter of fact, uh, the sister is involved with daily money management mm. uh, because apparently her mother is not remembering things with a checkbook or something like that. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think it's a very troublesome situation. Well, what concerns you the most? What the older woman is doing or what the adult daughter is doing well, I'm or not doing? I'm concerned about two things, and this is what I t told David. Number one, that his mother is putting herself in danger, and if she keeps going on this trajectory, at some point she'll fall, she'll break her hip, and where does she go? She goes to the nursing home. She doesn't want to go there, but if she breaks her hip, she's going to have to go to the emergency room. Well, so would room. you suggest that, that they preemptively uh, move her into long-term care facility in order to possibly prevent something that hasn't happened yet? It ha well, it has happened. She's fallen many times. It has okay. happened more than once. But yes, I'm suggesting that there are options like assisted living or other situations other than living isolated in a home away from other people where, you know, nobody's going to find you if you've fallen and you can't get up. Okay. And what does this woman want to do? What does she want her life to look like? She insists on living at home. She says, I've lived here all my life. I've lived here for 35 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is where I'm going to be. Mm -hmm. But uh, she's putting herself at risk. And that's the question that I think is the one we need to address. So should older people have the right to make bad choices? I would say if they're putting their life at risk, no. 
It's like telling people to wear seat belts. We don't have a problem well, with that. I, in our I don't society. know that I think that that's an analogous situation. Why not? I think seat, wearing seat belts is something that is relatively objective. Either somebody's not wearing a seat belt or they are wearing a seat right. belt. It's about public safety as well as the safety of the driver. Um, in the case of an individual adult who's living their life and who's living independently with some help, I think it's patronizing and it's paternal paternalistic to um, to deny them. Paternalistic? Yeah. Are you calling me a paternalist? I am actually in this case well, calling you a paternalist. Maybe it's not so bad if paternalism just means helping other people. Yeah, but people. How, how are you to decide? What's the threshold for your decision making about when to intervene? In her case, she does not want to be moved to some other location. Okay. So we should help her make that choice instead of the bad choice of falling well, down. You said that her adult daughter is providing care. What care is the adult daughter well, providing? Well, I wonder about that because uh, I know the daughter, at least this is what I've heard from David, we don't always get the full story from people. You know that. But from what David tells me, the daughter has arranged for a home equity loan uh, from mom. Hmm. And uh, some of that money, I think her, her uh, husband, that is the daughter's husband, Sean, he has a new vitamin business, supplements, and hmm. he thinks this can really go big. So uh, I think some of that money is finding its way into the vitamin business. Hmm. See, for me, that would be a red flag. Why? That would be more of a red flag than the mother walking in the garden. What's the difference? Which is not to say I'm not concerned about her well-being and safety. Uh, well, okay, there's two things here. There's the mother making decisions about her own self and what she does. And then there are other people who are making decisions that may be exploiting her, abusing her, or neglecting her. Well, look, and those are, they're both important and they relate okay. to her well-being, but they're different. They're two different things, I grant you that. But in both cases, we're starting with the idea that the mother has the right to make bad choices. Right. She's making two bad choices, in my opinion. Number one, the choice to put her life at risk by falling alone at home. And number two, taking out her equity from her house and turning it over to the uh, son-in-law uh, for a business venture. Do you know that, that she's succeed. actually involved in this decision? She signed the papers. Mm, okay. And so tell me about Dave. To what extent is Dave involved in these decisions? He wants to be involved, but he doesn't know the whole story, and he lives at a distance, mm -hmm. so he doesn't get to see his mom that often, but he's seen enough of it to see that there's a problem here. He's worried. Okay. He's guilty. He feels that, you know, one of these days she could fall and mm -hmm. end up in the emergency room. And who knows what happens to the money from that home equity loan. Okay. So has Dave actually asked to have a family conversation with his mom and with his sister? He did, but he asked the sister, and the sister said it would distress the mother too uh, much to have this kind of conversation. That's a red flag for me also. Why? Why? Because that's another example of taking away some dignity from the mother. It may in fact upset the mother. I don't know enough about it to know whether it would be putting the mother in a situation that she doesn't have the capacity for. In principle though, to, to not have a conversation uh, with that reason, that you don't want to upset someone? So David, this is, you said it's life and death. It is, it's very serious. So David should just pick up the phone and call mom and say, listen, uh, what about that home equity loan? Do you really think Sean's business is gonna succeed or what about the full? Well, no, there might be an alternative such as Dave making a trip and asking that his sister meet with him. Face to face. And his mom face to face. I, I would even suggest bringing in a third party. Has, has Dave thought about that? I'm not sure. I was thinking maybe we should uh, get protective services involved. Uh, That's I, a pretty extreme solution. David never heard of protective services, mm. and I said that to him, and he said, isn't that for children? Mm. And I said, yes, there's child protective services, mm -hmm. but there's also elder protective mm -hmm. services. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think in a situation like this where we have clear, unmistakable neglect of self <laughs> and strong evidence of exploitation, we have to stop this. Well, I, I really appreciate your fervor around this issue, but I'd also want to step back and say everything you're saying is speculative at this point. You haven't told me that the mother has had some sort of assessment about her capacity. We're going to send her into a psychiatrist? That's What's not this what I about? mean. No, a, an assessment to see how 
cognitively she's functioning, whether she's oriented to time, place, and space, the extent to which she's able to take care of herself, her daily needs. Don't we presume that people I don't have think capacity? That you, I, I think that if you feel like this is a dangerous situation, or your friend does, that you can't presume anything. There's a lot of questions here. So we have to challenge her even if she doesn't want to have a mental status examination. Well, if you think that she's somehow putting her own well-being at risk, and you think she's a victim of abuse, there has to be some mm. people from the outside who are professionals who intervene. What about guardianship? I've heard a bit about that as a way of stepping in here. Maybe David could become her guardian. Well, I think that you're only offering the most extreme kind of solution. Maybe you could become the guardian. I don't want to be a guardian. <laughs> Actually, Somebody needs to get well, involved in this. And I think I've offered sort of a, a middle way that somebody from the outside who has more objectivity and doesn't have financial interest. You brought up this idea of a financial legacy, an inheritance. Yeah, I think David was counting on inheriting that house and uh, using it to pay for his children's education, actually, mm. now that I think about it. So David is also interested in Well, the he money. may have an interest there, too. Okay. But I know that he doesn't want to see his mom fall. Right. I, I was thinking about one of these things you hang around your neck, help, I've fallen and I can't mm. get up. But I'm not sure how well they work. I'm not sure how well they work either. And I've, I've actually read some, some research that says they may not work as well as they were intended to. And also because sometimes the person who's fallen who actually uses the technology correctly doesn't really report the significance of yeah. their, you know. I don't think his mom wants to complain to anybody about the situation. Okay. And the way I see it, we prevent people from making bad choices all the time. We protect them. That's really why we require that people be part of Social Security. That's why we have consumer protection. I said the example of seat belts. I don't see a problem with preventing people from making bad choices. I think that's what we should do. But we need to protect people. These examples you're giving are examples that are regulated at a governmental level and right. they affect many citizens. Your example is of a private citizen in her own home. And you seem sufficiently concerned that something needs I to am. happen, I but am. that also uh, that there might be some malfeasance on the part yes, of at yes. least her daughter. Absolutely and right. And some conflicted interests on the part of her son. Absolutely right. Um, there are no federal regulations that are going to solve this problem unless and until you at least figure out what the scope of the problem is. Well, and that requires that's bringing true. in resources. But we can't do that until we get an outside intervention, whether protective services, guardianship, something, because the, the sister wants to prevent anybody from looking in on this. And the way you describe it, you know, you keep talking about her rights, she should make choices. I think she's going to be dying with her rights on. And mm. that is not an outcome I want to see. You talk about this in an all or nothing way. And what I'm suggesting is, is not that anything goes. What I'm suggesting is what's really at stake here is her well-being. Yeah, and I agree her well-being is a balance between her autonomy to the extent that she can exercise it. Uh, and paternalism, that that's the word you well, used. And, and uh, the things that need to be in place to make sure that she's safe and functioning well, whether that's in her own home or in another setting. And if her family is not in a position to make those decisions, then a third party needs to be accessed, well, but it doesn't have to yes. be necessarily going all the way to protective services or getting a court-appointed guardian. It's too premature to decide Is that Is there something yet. wrong with a guardian? I'm not saying there's anything wrong, but sometimes the solution is more extreme than the problem is. Hmm. You mean it might make it worse? It could make it worse. Hmm. I hadn't thought about that. I just am looking at it from David's point of view that he is, he came to me uh, but he now needs to go to somebody else. He does. But I'm not sure who. I'm not sure who. I'm not sure where we go next with this. It seems like we need some kind of protective services that will come in here to help David. But I'm not sure if, if they actually will help him. I think that the best advice to give your friend is to 
do as much research as you can on the services available in the community where his mother lives. So you're and saying it's local, there's something local. I'm saying that there's some, probably something local. If mm. she lives in a metropolitan area, there's going yeah. to be um, some sort of resource and referral place that she can access they they through the area the agencies on aging, All right. um, through a senior center, through the local hospital, through certified senior advisors, senior, private yes, geriatric exactly. care manager, mm -hmm. somebody. Yes. Okay. That costs money though, doesn't it? Well, I don't think you're going to get out of this for free. So Dave is going to have to pay or his sister. They hold on to that money pretty tight. Well, the vitamin so, business needs lots so of work So let's go capital. back to what I thought was really the premise of this discussion, which is the well-being of the mother. I think that's the place to start, yes. Okay. And so what's in the best interest of the mother? To me, the best interest of the mother is to protect her from ending her life crawling on the ground trying to get back into her house the next time this happens. I think that happens. you're completely missing the point. I think that it's really unfortunate that happened in the yes. past, that it happened last week. Well, it could happen and again. And I hope it doesn't happen again. It could happen but again next week. But it seems like there's a more extensive issue, which has to do with whether she's getting the care she needs in the setting she's living in, whether her family is, is providing the care she needs, whether her daughter is exploiting her or not and the questions of her own capacity. Yes. And you've, these questions need to be answered before I will be convinced that she's making bad decisions and before I'll be convinced that the most extreme solution should be brought into place. I mean, bringing in protective services actually takes away the choice of Dave. Takes away the choice? It takes away Dave's choice. How does it do that? Well, because he's chosen one of the most extreme remedies. And there's all this stuff in between that he could try that he will not have tried. And it sort of displaces the responsibility in a way. Hmm. It may end up that that's the solution, but, but it's, it's too premature? soon to know. Yes. Too soon to know. Yes. Okay. Well, I can accept that, but I worry about the fact that she may have some diminished mental capacity. And I think that when we go in there, from everything David has told me, uh, we're not going to get a clear cut picture of what the mother thinks or knows it or believes. It doesn't matter. You got to know, you got to find out something. Oh, Rick. Dave? Oh, I'm glad you got me here. What? <laughs> She's fallen? Oh, my. Okay, thanks, Dave. Thanks very much. I, I'm sorry that she fell. We'll figure out a way to deal with this. Bye-bye. That was David, and uh, exactly what I was afraid of has happened. Uh, she did fall again, and he brought in a home care agency. Okay. And uh, they're working to put things back together, and uh, I don't know whether she'll be able to stay at home or not, but uh, he just told me they've run into another problem, which is the home care worker who came into this house uh, recognized what was going on and spent a long time talking afterwards uh, with the sister and with David, and uh, I think they've re come to believe that this is elder abuse, as I was saying. So what the home care worker wow. said is she is going to report it to the government. Mm -hmm. And David said, no, we shouldn't do that because we think we can work out something with a, you know, a pendant around the neck or telephone calls or something else like that. And the home care worker said, she doesn't have any choice. She has to report it to the yeah, government. Yeah, she's a mandatory reporter. Mandatory but, reporting. And who is, who is the perpetrator of the abuse? Well, she said, this is the home care agency, said, uh, this is an, exactly what I said. This is a person who has been self-neglecting, and that's the reason why she fell another time. She never should have been walking up and down the stairs that way. And second, uh, there's all this money going out, the vitamin business, mm -hmm. and it's a pattern. It's everything that we've been talking about. Right. It's come to light, and now it's not just within the family. It's an outside agency knows about it. Right. But this mandatory reporting business, what does that mean? What's that all about? Well, it means that the home care, home care worker is in a professional position where she has no choice except to report when she sees evidence. What do you mean no choice? That, that could completely harm what we're trying to do to prevent how, this getting, no, getting how out could, of hand. How could it completely harm? We now have a third party yes. who's come in and has identified what the issues are. And there's two issues. It's yes. the two issues you were concerned That's about. Right. Self-neglect on the right. part of the mother 
and right. some That's sort right. of exploitation. But you convinced me, you convinced me, Jennifer, that we should try an intermediate solution before we went to this well, but mandatory there was, reporting. And I still think that that's the best solution. And she fell again. There was a crisis and it triggered this other solution. Maybe we can convince the home care agency to keep it quiet no, for a while. No, that wouldn't be the right thing to do. Why not? I think what you do now is you, you and put Dave on the phone and I'll talk to him because you're not obviously not giving him the best advice. I don't the, know what advice The advice is now you move forward. Now that they have some information, You've got a third party. Yeah, Use it as a resource. Find out what the mother needs. We've got a government investigation well, to, going on here. Okay, fine. But in the, the mother meanwhile, doesn't want that. it doesn't matter at this point. Now what we need to do is figure out how to help the mother have the best life she can possibly have. Wait a minute. You say and, and if, in fact, she's being exploited by her yes, daughter and be. the son-in-law, then the best thing that can happen is for their, their gig to be up because there's intervention from the outside. But you said it doesn't matter what the mother thinks. That's not what I said. I never said that. You're putting words in my mouth. The mother doesn't want things well, to be reported. Well, I understand that she doesn't want things to be reported, but it's already happened, and it yes. can't be undone. But and so the most compassionate thing to do now, with outside help, maybe she'll never be convinced otherwise. Her desire for it to not happen and to not be a problem can be acknowledged, but they need to move forward and find the best solution. And everybody may not agree. Usually families don't have complete unanimity when it comes to these kinds of complicated situations. But you said that we should try an intermediate solution step by step. And, now and it's I'm gotten saying out of now hand. it got out of hand the minute that an outside person came because of a crisis who is a mandatory reporter and now other entities. I don't are like that mandatory reporting okay, law. Okay. It well, takes away the right of the mother and of David so and now of you're other changing people to work sides. It out. You convinced me. That we should try I, an intermediate if that's step. What, if that's what you think I convinced you of, then you missed my entire point. My entire point is that, yes, sometimes people need help. And sometimes people are living in a situation that doesn't match their needs. And yes. sometimes the like this others in, in our lives are not giving us the help that we need and maybe even exploiting us. Like the but sister. what's the most important thing is to balance the rights of the individual to be a whole human being, regardless of their age and capacity, with safety and wellness. Right. And Sa safety is my concern. And, and this question of should older people have the right to make bad choices, I start out by saying no. They don't have the right to make choices that are going to put themselves in irrevocable harm. Right. But somehow we got from there to a situation in which all of a sudden this government agency is writing them up, doing an investigation. Who knows how long that'll take? It becomes kind of a, a, a public scandal. Right. I it's, don't think anybody wants that. Well, I don't think anybody probably does either. It seems like that's what happens when things get are out of our hands. Right. Okay. That was the telephone and call I think that I didn't want to get. Maybe they would have liked to keep control over the entire situation, so-called control over the situation. I know the sister does. Okay, by deciding when to bring in outside entities and what those entities would be. And what I'm saying is a little reality therapy here. It's too late for that now because there was a crisis. The decisions hadn't been made yet. Maybe we can negotiate with the protective services or whoever is investigating this and convince the sister to get an outside money manager or somebody in there who will be, you know, uh, sunlight is the best disinfectant. Mm -hmm. But sunlight in a situation like this mm -hmm. is not the same thing as having it be written up in a government case and a file and a bureaucracy and all the rest of that. That's the thing that troubles me right. about this, that, that somehow we went from one extreme right. to the other. Right. And we didn't do the intermediate steps that you yourself recommended. And I still recommend them. Well, maybe and it's not too late. Okay. Maybe I can talk to David and suggest that he go visit the mm -hmm. government office and other people and see if he can come up with a plan yeah. that can stop this from getting out of hand. Otherwise, I, I don't know where it's going. I just right. don't know where it's going. Right. She's still living at home. Right. She hasn't been taken out of the home. She could fall again. Right. Anyway, I think that the... It's a tough one. I really, I don't know. It's a tough case, but... <laughs> It sounds to me like there it could be a solution if we could get other parties involved, right. more than the family, but less than the government, something that right. could 
mediate, negotiate, find out what was going on. And sooner rather than later, before the crisis happens, no, in yes. a more intentional way, uh, you know, the, the family dynamics that prevent having these conversations, you know, sister doesn't want to upset mother, brother, brother's all twisted over this, not wanting to defy sister, right. not wanting to hurt mother. It could actually be that they all really care about each other and there's no malfeasance happening. I don't know. Right. What I, I can't do, prove it. What I do know is that it's really complicated and people don't know how to resolve these issues and often until it's too late. And so that's the opportunity for, for intervention at a larger scale. Okay. We've been talking mostly at the individual level. How do you intervene? What is the threshold? How do we know what when do you think a the threshold is? Been, gosh, it's... I think that if we're talking at an individual level, you have to know the baseline for the individual to begin with. And often family is in the best situation to know what that is. But you have to have something to compare other behaviors to. Yes, that's a fair right? point. Okay. So you can't draw a br bright red line and say this is the point. No, no. But, but I would draw the br bright red line at the point when all of her savings, which is her home equity, is going to go out the window with mm -hmm. the Sean and the vitamin business, right. or where she's going to fall and irrevocably lose the ability to live at home. Right. It seems to me that some of those cases, if I, I suspect in this case the, the, the older parent is not taking all the medication mm -hmm. or something else like that, I don't worry so much about those cases, mm -hmm. but I worry about where you're going to choose something, a bad choice, that is going to foreclose any possibility right. of making other choices. Right. That, to me, would be the bright And it's line. really hard to know if that's going to be the case based on one instance. I think that you make a really strong case about the fact that there had been multiple instances. Yes, it's and a pattern. And that the pattern is really the pa the important pattern, to pay it was attention many, to. Many falls. She was. David said she was bruised, mm -hmm. and of course she recovered from those bruises. Fortunately, no bones were broken. Mm -hmm. But uh, th there's got to be a solution to this. I keep coming back to this this idea: should older people have the right to make bad choices? And my answer generally is no when their choice is going to result in irrevocable harm to themselves. Mm -hmm. Let's leave aside harm to others. Mm -hmm. In this case, it's harm to themselves, her, her wealth, her, her health, uh, whatever you want to call it. That seems to me to be the critical Well, what case. about the more subtle cases where that maybe take longer to unfold and they're hidden from view because they're not as extreme? And I would say these are pretty typical, and maybe we've even engaged in these behaviors ourselves. So things like not complying with what a doctor asks us to do, not taking mm. medication. You remind me, uh, I didn't take my hypertension pill today. Yeah, okay. I'm well, non-compliant. So I'll see if there's a pattern. I'll ask you a week from now, a month yeah. from now, right? One time I don't think makes a pattern. It's the behavior over the long term. Mm. But sometimes, I, you know, maybe your wife doesn't even know that you're not compliant. You're going to call protective services on me? No, I'm going to call your wife. Oh, all right. Okay. She'll well, get me to do the so right thing. So there's not complying with what a doctor says. There's uh, eating foods that we know are bad for us. Right. There's having an extra glass of wine. Uh, this sounds like the not America exercising. that I know. <laughs> well, I know and love, but, you know, not exercising even though it's clear that being physically active is the best way to live a vital so, life. So shouldn't we intervene in these cases, like with children and the diet in schools? Shouldn't we make exercise more available to people, whether people say they want it or not, just so that we make sure that people do the right thing? They're going to do the wrong well, thing unless I think, we help them. I, I, I think that behavior change is very difficult, and we do actually make good food and exercise programs accessible to many people, not all people though. There are people who live in areas where there isn't good food available, right. easily available. Food deserts. Food deserts. Right. So, True. you know, it's, it's really complicated. Okay. So there's a place here, in, at least as you understand it, for some sort of public collective action to intervene for helping people avoid bad choices. Like I give well, I examples. don't frame it as bad choices. I mean, Why not? I, because I think that that's a really punitive, narrow way to think about it. Again, I go back to, I know you want to simplify this, but I keep having to go back to the balance between an individual's right to live the way that they want to live, even if I don't agree with it, and how do we help each other have good lives and be safe? Well, I think one way that we help each other is by living longer, living a good life, and giving people the opportunity to do that. And when we see them going down the wrong road, uh, we step in and help them so they go down the right road. 
So you're an interventionist. I'm an interventionist. I'm a paternalist. I think okay. we need to protect people from the harms that they're doing to themselves. That's why we have high prices on cigarette taxes. And there's still people who smoke. I'm not saying we should abolish or make unlawful all these things. I'm saying we should introduce elements that make it more difficult to make bad choices. Okay. So when I say protect people from making bad choices, I don't mean making it unlawful or send in the health care. Okay, police. so let's say in an ideal world, any possible bad choice that a human could make, that there is some sort of mechanism in place mm -hmm. to protect them from making that bad choice. Do you think that all bad choice making is going to go away? No, it won't go away. Uh, I recognize that. That's why the example of diet or smoking yeah. or be driving or any of these other things is, is, makes the point. But we can make it more difficult for people to make the bad choices, and we can make it easier for them to make the good choices. And that pertains to everything in aging, because after all, in this case of his mother, uh, she's chosen to stay at home mm -hmm. in a situation that's putting her life at danger Maybe we need to give her some better choices, maybe mm -hmm. some kind of home care, maybe some kind of uh, electronic device, whatever it would be. Maybe so somebody protected. to manage her finances other than her daughter. Exactly. I and, agree. And that's where we need to step in. Otherwise, And all of those kinds of efforts allow her to maintain her dignity and take walks in her garden, maybe with some assistance. I'm not against her walking in the garden. I'm I glad said we that agree before. on that. We agree on the garden. Okay. And we also agree on dignity. But uh, what, we, what we, I think, need to find is a yeah. way of implementing all this in a way that makes sense to David, to his sister, to yes. his mother, and to all of us. I Agreed. think we can do that. I think we can. Thank you. So we'd welcome questions at this point, if anybody has a question to ask. Sure, I'll ask a question. Um, as a caregiver, mm -hmm. a nurse who comes into the home, Many times I suspect that the patient is having some issues with dementia. And of course, they're very protective, defensive, don't even want to think about going there. What kinds of uh, gentle persuasions, perhaps, could I give the other family members or caregivers in that situation to encourage them to look into this more mm -hmm. clearly? Because obviously, when there is dementia, the older person or the person with dementia is not capable, perhaps, mm -hmm. of making the right decisions or correct decisions. Mm -hmm. Here's my answer to that. The word dementia covers a lot of different things. And uh, I would rather speak of diminished mental capacity, which can be differential. For example, a person may lose the ability to do financial decision making, keeping a checkbook checkbook or whatever, but be perfectly capable of making health care decisions or vice versa or anything else like that. So much as Jennifer would say, I want to reject the idea of a black and white determination. Uh, I also want to raise the question of why we're going to have the mental status test. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons that people fear such tests is that they fear that it may lead them down a road that ends in guardianship or conservatorship or a situation in which they then have really lost their rights as a citizen. And I think we need to worry about that. Um, I think we need to be very concerned about that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, a lot of nurses, and you're one, you know what I'm talking about, can make rough and ready assessments of things that are useful for limited purposes. There may not be a mental status test that is you know, definitive for a court proceeding, and that may not be the issue. So I think we really have to approach this in a more functional way. Why are we, we need to do that and for what purpose? And we need to get beyond the, la the label, certainly the label of Alzheimer's disease, which is very difficult to diagnose. And even the word dementia, better term, but still problematic. Mm. What are your comments? I hesitate to advise you, given that you're the expert in this area. Um, I tend to take an inquiry approach to just about anything, which means that I ask a lot of questions. And so, and often there's a time limit, I know, when you're a healthcare provider. But if there was a way to ask some really good questions of the family members to get a sense of what it is that they're worried about, as well as how they think that their family member is doing, um, without ever telling them that you're concerned or what you think is happening, um, to engage in that, that dialogue together so that you'll have a sense of what they think is going on. And then maybe you can target um, you know, subtly at first, and then maybe a little less subtly, 
some resources for them, you know, some, some brochures or cards or a, a web address um, to resources so that they may not access it right away. But there may come that point where they are so thankful <laughs> that they have that information because they finally realize that some threshold has been crossed, right, and that they need more help. So that's probably what I would do. I don't think that we can conv necessarily convince people to do stuff, especially if they're panicked and resistant. And this is one of the problems with dealing with bureaucratic solutions. Right. That they may take on a life of their and own. And it limits choice. And it limits yeah. choice. And we've certainly seen that in some cases of allegations of child abuse, some of which are based on fantasy and not even true. But once it gets into a juridical proceeding, it takes on a life of its own and you can't stop it. So um, that doesn't mean that we should just leave everything to the private world. Uh, I think that's what Jennifer and I were trying to get into. Um, it becomes very, very difficult. And, you know, there's some statistics around that suggest that beyond the age of 85, a lot of folks are going to have some diminished capacity. But I don't think we need to be unduly panicked about that right. because we need to you know, unpack that and be clear just how, how much does this interfere with ADLs, activities of daily living? Uh, where does it intervene, uh, interfere? And, uh, um, you know, I, I think those are the kind of questions yeah. which we need to ask. Everybody stay calm so stay we calm. can figure out what's going on. Right. Well, yeah. that's your <laughs> approach, and, and it's a good approach. Yeah. But uh, one of the things I've learned from working with people in hospitals and other medical settings is that there's sometimes a yeah. time pressure. And see, even when you do have to make a decision to report, not to report, to advise, I'm also a big believer in, in negotiation mm -hmm. in the sense of uh, working it out. I think you use the word persuasion, and sometime we can talk about it. I wrote a whole book about this one, Ethics in an Aging Society, but uh, and I, an article called From Informed Consent to Negotiated Consent. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think the more we can get yeah. away from the black and white, the juridical, into the interpersonal, the better off we are. Agreed. Okay. A rare moment of agreement. Yeah, right. Actually, we agree on something like that.